Hope you're having a great year. How many of you made New Year's resolutions? Yeah, I quit those a long time ago. I just try to be a little bit better each day. But if you had a new re resolution to be in church every week of the year, you've made the first weekend. Congratulations. We uh, just finished up a long season of Christmas services. We had some great Christmas Eve services. We've been going nonstop since December 23rd. Uh, it rained a lot, but we had some great services, and we're blessed to have you all here. And now we're kicking off the new year with a sermon series. Um, Pastor Dudley is not here this weekend. He'll be back next weekend. I want to encourage you to be sure to be back here because next weekend he will kick off the theme for 2022 and also lay out really the entire year of sermon series and some of the things we're going to do to lean into the theme for 2022. So be sure and be back here next weekend. I want to introduce our speaker for this weekend. He's a guest. Uh, let me go back a little ways. Back in the early 1980s, there was a pastor of a church in Des Moines, Iowa. It was called Westside Church in Des Moines. And that pastor's name was Bob Scott. Bob Scott was his name back in Des Moines, Iowa. Well, Bob got a call to work for a missionary organization, so he left the church and then helped him hire a young guy just out of college named Dudley Rutherford. So Dudley took Bob's church back in Des Moines, Iowa, and became the pastor there. Then a few years later, I visited Des Moines and attended Dudley's church and got connected. Suzanne Walden got connected to that church that Dudley was at, all kind of because Bob was there and brought Dudley in. Well, this weekend, we have Bob's son with us. His name is John Scott, so just tie all this together. John Scott is a pastor out in Hemet a church called Community Christian Church in Hemet. It's one of the largest churches out there. He has been there 35 years, which is a testimony to faithfulness and uh, discipline. Pastors just don't stay that long at churches, but he has been there and stayed faithful and has grown a great church. So if you know anybody out in the Hemet area, uh, invite them to go to that church. His name is John Scott. He's got a wife named Michelle, and they have two daughters and two grandchildren. And uh, I've heard uh, John preach a couple of times this weekend. You are going to be blessed. The first thing you'll notice, I'll just warn you as you walk out, you will notice that John Scott and Dudley Rutherford share the exact same barber. But don't hold that against you. You please welcome John Scott as he comes to preach for us. What's up, Shepherd? How's everybody doing? Happy New Year. Is this the best place to be as you start a new year or what, right? This is awesome. So thank you so much for letting me be with you. I know you are seriously disappointed, but Dudley just needs a break. But I'm gonna give you guys in the front a break because you're usually looking way up here and your necks are like this and today you're gonna be like this. So I'm, you're welcome. Those of you in the front, I'm gonna help you out, right? Well, it is good to be here. I've been looking forward to this and uh, I, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background to know how I like to kind of operate and deal with people. I, I love being a pastor. Like Tim said, I've been there actually almost 35 years. Easter, I'll celebrate that. And uh, I, I love being a pastor, not embarrassed about that at all, not ashamed at all, but I don't tell people I'm a pastor right off when I meet them. Because I've found that that changes the conversation way too fast. I want them to be real, right? I, I wanna get to know them. If they find out I'm a pastor, then they put up all these barriers, all these walls. So I, I walked into a gym several years ago, back when I used to go to a gym, and um, I, I walk in, and this lady on the other side of the gym goes, hi, Pastor John! And I immediately saw four people I will never have a conversation with. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to talk to that guy. He's a pastor, right? I, I meet my next door neighbor for the first time. Uh, he moves in, and, and I walked over to meet him. His dog bit me, uh, true. <laughs> and then he comes out of the house, and he says, first thing, before I can say hi, or your dog just bit me, he says, I hear you're a pastor. I'm like, he goes, my wife's Catholic and I'm Protestant. <laughs> I go, dude, that is funny. I go, that's funny, right? But that's why I don't tell people I'm a pastor right off. So one day, I'm sitting in Starbucks. I'd like to say pillars, but they're not open. Anyway, uh, I was sitting in a Starbucks, and they have two comfortable chairs, right? All the other ones are those really hard wood, we don't want you to stay here very long chairs. And so I found the comfortable chair, I plopped down, I got my chai, because I don't like coffee. When I grow up, I'm gonna like it, but I don't yet. So I have a chai, and I got my computer, I'm just sitting there in my chair, and then this guy comes up and he sits down next to me. He goes, do you mind? I go, no, not at all. And that's one of the reasons I like to go and just hang out there, I get to meet some people. So this guy sits down and he starts telling me his life story. Like he's a nurse, he works three 12 hour shifts a day or a week and then sometimes more than that. But he's got all this extra time and he says, I'm thinking about applying here. I go at Starbucks and he goes, yeah. I go, why would you do that? He goes, well, like I said, I got some extra time because, but the main reason, 
I think this is a good place to meet the ladies. I'm not telling them who I am and what I do at all. This is going to be fun, right? I said, well, tell me about your plan. So he goes, well, first of all, he goes, there's some pretty good looking girls that work here. And so he starts telling me by name, which ones have the best eyes, the best smile, the whole thing, right? No joke, while he's explaining to me this plan of coming and working at Starbucks so that he can meet the ladies, every woman that walked in knew me. So everyone that walks in goes, hi, John. I go, hey. He keeps telling the story. Next one walks in, hi. I'm going, hey. Next one walks in, hi, hi. And he's like, you already know all the ladies, right? You already know all the people. How is this possible? I go, actually, I, I do come here. I didn't tell him because my church is right down the street, and a lot of these people go to my church. I'm, nothing like that. I just, I just let him go. So he just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going with his story, right? So I'm, no less than like a dozen ladies have walked in and said hi to me. One of them on the way out, she hits the door, and she looks back, and she goes, bye, pastor. <laughs> and he says, did she say Master? I said, yes, she did. <laughs> I just let him sit with that for a while. And then I said, no, she said, uh, by pastor. Oh, you're a pastor? Pfft, conversation dead, right? <laughs> so I don't always tell people that, but I will tell you this. I love your pastor. Pastor Dudley is an amazing guy and has been a friend of mine for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I met him, uh, he came into my life at a real critical time. Like, like Tim said, my, my dad had been the pastor of that church. He resigned to go work with a missions group and, uh, and then got back into the pastoral ministry in just a couple of years in another state. But, but right at that moment, my dad resigned. I was just a few months away from graduating. So I graduated midterm my senior year. So Dudley came the summer I started my senior year and he was my pastor for about five months. But in that time, right when he came was also the time that I said, God, I'm tired of living two lives. Our church was downtown. My school was in the suburbs. This group never knew this group. And I had effectively, through my high school years, become two different people. And it all kind of came crashing down at one point, and I just said, God, I'm, I'm done. I'm absolutely all in. I'm all yours. In that moment, in that time was when when Dudley shows up. And he probably doesn't even realize, because he had just made, he doesn't realize how important that time was in my life, but he challenged me, he encouraged me, he still encourages me today as a pastor. He'll text me every now and then. I just had a really good friend pass away a few, few months ago. Dudley was one of the first ones to text me. And he still encourages, still inspires. And I, and I get online every night, I watch you guys, I watch what you're doing here, and I'm, I'm encouraged and inspired by what you're doing. But your pastor is a special, special guy. And so I'm glad he got a break, and I'm glad I get to be here even though it sucks for you. Now, can, I, can I say that? I don't, I don't know what I'm allowed to say here. I don't, I don't watch enough to know what I can say and what I can't, so I'm just gonna say what I would say, all right? Well, here's the deal. Um, I do love Pastor Dudley, but let me tell you a little bit about me and then we'll get going, all right? So like Tim said, I've been married to Michelle. We've been married over 33 years. Here's a picture of our family. Uh, this is Michelle. I now call her the Silver Fox. And then our daughter's Megan, Sam. My son-in-law, Craig, he's an inspector, um, investigator, detective at Hemet PD. But those people, you know, with the exception of my wife, because she's actually here, they, they don't really matter so much. It's the two little ones that I really want you to notice, right? So Vera is our granddaughter. She's going to be three this month. And then little Wyatt is six months old. Now, I'm just going to say being a grandparent is a phenomenal. How many of you are grandparents? Hands in the air. Wave them like you just don't care. Come on, grandparents. Okay, so I can tell right now, nine o'clock service is far older. There was like half the crowd were grandparents. This service, like 12 of us. So let me let all of you know the big secret that grandparents know. Grandkids are the reward for not killing your own kids. <laughs> I love my grandkids, man. They're, they're awesome. So at, at our church... Um, we, we do this thing where we pray for one, like every day. At, at my, my, my phone alarm is set for 111, 111 every day, and at 111 every day, I pray for the same guy who I know needs Jesus. I pray for him every day, and I, I'm praying that this is the year where he says, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. That, that's what I've been praying for, for him for now for several years. But even though as we, we kind of entered a new year, and even though I want you to have that kind of passion, that kind of desire, and I know, I know Pastor Dudley talks about this, I want you to have that person that you're thinking about, that you could lead to Christ, you could invite to church, you, you could show them Jesus. Uh, th- this is a special time at the beginning of the year. I, I want you to understand, even though that's an important thing, and I want you to do that, I, I want to talk today about the other side, like, like you being the one. So, so pray for that one, right? But you be that one. In fact, let me go back to the pray for one. One of the things at our church that we say, we say it this way, if heaven and hell are real, the most loving thing you could ever do for anybody is introduce them to Jesus. So you really love someone, you're gonna, you're gonna tell them the good news about Jesus, right? So there, that's the one that we're kind of helping, but I want you to be the one, and, and I wanna think about this as we begin a brand new year, and I'm, I'm honored to be with you as we start off this new year, but how can we be the one who's gonna make a difference, right? And so we're gonna look at a story in John chapter six. If you have your Bible, find that. John chapter six, and whether you have like the paper Bible or you have that, you know, thousand dollar phone Bible, whatever, uh, get, get the Bible out there. John chapter six will be there in just a second. But this, the setting happens in a crowd. Now, I think there's significance in crowds, but one of the things that happens in a crowd, and even like this, like we're all here for the same reason, like we're, most of us are here to, to honor Jesus. Some of you are here dragged here because you did something stupid yesterday and your mom said you're coming. So I, I understand that, but we're all here like because of Jesus, we're here to worship. And so we're here, and this is awesome, this is exciting, but, but even in a crowd, it's possible to kind of be lost in the crowd. Some of you, you're like, well, I'm not on stage, and I don't sing, and I don't play an instrument, and I don't speak, and maybe you even think of yourself as like insignificant, like you're in the crowd, but you're, you're just not that important, and that's just, I'm going to tell you right now, that's just not true. Every single one of us can be used by God in unique and powerful, miraculous ways if we're, if we're open to that. And we're gonna look at that today in John chapter six. Now, John chapter six uh, takes place by the Sea of Galilee. A, a few years ago, my wife and I were back in the Holy Land. And uh, it was our first time there. And, and we went over, and I love Jerusalem and all of that. But my favorite place was the Sea of Galilee. Here's a couple of pictures. Like this is a sunset on the Sea of Galilee. The next one is like the sun rise on the Sea of Galilee. I just, I love being there. So much of Jesus' ministry happened at the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. It's really called both things. So much happened right there of Jesus' ministry around that lake, even on that lake. I, I tried to walk on the water. It didn't, didn't work for me. <laughs> but I thought, hey, I know a guy who did it, so I'm gonna try it too. And uh, no, it didn't work. But I, love, I love the Sea of Galilee. I love all of Jesus' ministry that happened around that. There's another sea uh, south of that called the Dead Sea. Now, the funny thing about this is, some of you may not know this, your pastor, Pastor Dudley, wrote a book about when you tour the Holy Land, here's the things you need to see and here's what you need to know. And so here's a picture of a friend of mine. His name's Tim Liston. He and I are reading Dudley's book while floating in the Dead Sea. We got Dudley's book right there. And right when we did that, you know, we got done, we got the picture, we posted it on social media, and Dudley saw it. It's like, yeah, you know, so it was, it was kind of funny. But anyway, forget the Dead Sea, back to the Sea of Galilee. That's where we're gonna be, and we're gonna hang out here for a while. And what I want you to do, I want you to see this in John 6. I'm gonna read like 15 verses, and then we're gonna draw some stuff out of here. I think is, is really, really cool, when, especially when it, we talk about beginning a brand new year and, and what we want God to do through our life. Okay, so let's do this. John chapter six, beginning in verse one. It says, after this, I'm gonna come back and explain some of that later. But he says, after this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already, listen to this, he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, like he's got his own little sack lunch. Listen, but what good is that with this huge crowd. Like, how are we going to feed these people? I I found a kid with a sack lunch, but really? Like, there's thousands of people here. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. 
So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. So some scholars estimate between 10 and 15,000. Some people have said maybe even as many as 20,000 people were there. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. So it's like a buffet. You just keep going back. They had as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus said to his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets. Everybody say 12 baskets. See, I watch Dudley. I know he makes you do that. Like he say this and you say it. So I wanted you to feel more like at home today. All right. So they picked up the pieces of, and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley, barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we've been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. A couple things about this. One is, this is a unique story. So we have four gospel accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's very few stories that are told in all four. Let me give you a couple of examples that are. The crucifixion, all four. The resurrection, all four. Jesus feeds the 5,000, all four. And there's very few other stories that are in all four accounts of Jesus' life. But this is one of them that's told four times. And twice, Matthew and Mark, who literally took more of a chronological uh, approach to how they, they kind of like talked about Jesus' life, they say what's happening right before this is Jesus finds out that, G, that John the Baptist has been beheaded. John the Baptist is his you know, second cousin. They're, they're related. And so Jesus literally wants to just get away with his disciples and grieve. And then the crowds show up. So John says after this, but he doesn't refer to that other stuff. He's just like, in, in, the, in, the, in the space of time, then this happened, right? But, but we know from Matthew and Mark, like this is right after John the, ba the Baptist is beheaded. Jesus wants to get away by himself, but here comes the crowd. But even in that, he's not gonna turn anybody away. He says, hey, how are we gonna feed these people? But he already knew what he was gonna do. I love this story, and what I wanna do, even though the story is all about Jesus, I wanna learn from this little boy. And maybe it's just kind of a way to look at this story. Maybe you've never looked at this story before this way. But I, I want to look at it through the, the eyes or through the lens of this little boy. And I want to see what he did. And maybe we can learn through that and learn from him. So here's the first thing. If you're a note taker, write this down. He was open to the idea. He was like open to the idea. Now, there's a lot of things we don't have in the story. Like we don't have the conversation between Andrew and the little boy. Like, hey, I see you got a lunch there. We're, we're trying to feed like 15,000 people here. We're like, what do you think? I'm like, yeah. It's like, we don't have that conversation, right? We just know he apparently was open to the idea because we keep reading and then Jesus has his lunch and he's feeding everybody with it. So he's, he's open to the idea. I just want you to start there. Like the, the church I serve, Community Christian in Hemet, was started in 1981 by a group, a small group of retired people who left the church that they were a part of because that church was not open to the idea of doing anything for young people. And so a group of retired people started this church called Community in order to reach young people. Now just think about this for a minute. A group of 30 to 40 retired people is not necessarily a magnet for middle schoolers. <laughs> so this church has started in 81. In 1987, they're still open to the idea. It's just not happening. And they called me and they asked me to be their youth pastor. At the time, just less than 100 people, there were two kids in the whole church. One was the pastor's son, he was in middle school, and one was the music minister's son, he was in middle school. That was it. But they were open to the idea. They're still, as a group, largely retired people wanted to reach young people. In fact, when I went there, I was not just the youth pastor, literally, my job description was anybody 49 and under was mine. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. The pastor, like, we'd be going through the, the cards on the weekend. We had some guests. Oh, yeah. He goes, 37 years old. Yeah, that one's yours. Anybody 50 and over, he took care of, followed up on. Anybody under 49 was mine. And so we began to reach young people and reach young families and that church. I'm so glad that here's a group of people who were open to the idea, even though they didn't know how to do it. They just say, God, use us to reach young families. Use us to reach young kids. And now we're able to do that because they were willing to do that. 
Just think about this. When, when you were maybe first open to the idea of even showing up at Shepherd, or, or think about the, time, the, the first time you thought about maybe being open to the idea of serving, or open to the idea of giving, or open to the idea of, of like literally sharing your faith with somebody, like starting that, that difficult conversation, right? And yeah, it's scary. All that stuff's scary. But it's out of those like little steps where we're, we're open to the idea and we say, okay, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. It's out of that that God does the extraordinary. And now you look back, some of you look back, you've been, you've been here and you've been serving now for years and you've seen what God is able to do. But it all started as scared as you were with you just saying, I'll give it a shot. I'll, like I'm, I'm open to the idea. Uh, I came across a story years ago that helps me just kind of remember the value of being open to the idea of Jesus truly being in charge of my life. It's called the road of life. Let me just read it for you. It says, at first I saw God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like a president, and I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I really didn't know him. But later on, when I met Christ, it seemed as though life were rather like a bike ride, but it was a tandem bike. And I noticed that Christ was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has not been the same since. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But he knew how to take the, but when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do to hang on, even though it looked like madness. He just said, pedal. I worried. I was anxious and asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and he didn't answer. And I started to learn to trust him. I forgot my boring life and entered into the adventure. And when I'd say I'm scared, he leaned back and touched my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, acceptance, and joy. They gave, my, they gave me gifts to take on my journey, my, my Lord's and mine. And we're off again. He said, give the gifts away. They're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did to the people we met. And I found that in giving, I received, and still our burden was light. I did not trust him at first in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it. But he knows bike secrets knows how to make it bend to take sharp corners, knows how to jump to clear high rocks, knows how to fly to short and scary passages, and I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze in my face with my delightful, constant companion, Jesus Christ. And when I'm sure I just can't do any more, he just smiles and says, pedal. See, when God comes into our life, there is this moment where he just wants us to just just be open to the idea. And we start walking with him, and the adventure begins. This little boy was open to the idea. Number two, if you want to write it down, he was willing to share. He was willing to share. I go back in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter three and four. There's this amazing story where God kind of spend some time with Moses. Remember, there's a burning bush, and Moses wants to check it out, and God says, take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. So they have this conversation. The conversation goes like this. Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to get my people out of there. And Moses says, no, 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 no. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Not me. I'm not good enough. I can't speak enough. I, I, no, 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 no. And every single time, God's answer is the same. Dude, it's not you. It's me. Now, he's not breaking up with Moses. I know some of you have used that line, right? It's not you, it's me. No, that's not what he means. What he means is, Moses, it's not about you and your ability. It's I'm going to be with you. I'm going to do this. You just need to get going. Again, like you need to be open to the idea, but, but it's further than that. I, you, you know, like We're going to say you need to be willing to share it. So God says at one point, he says, hey, what's in your hand? I, I think God's kind of frustrated, like excuse, excuse, excuse. And finally, God just says, hey, what's in your hand? Well, Moses was a, was a shepherd, and so he had a staff. You know, you've seen those pictures of the long stick, and sometimes they have like a little curly thing on the top. He's, that's what he has. He has got a staff. But I heard a pastor talk about it, and he was like, it wasn't just a staff. It was his identity. I mean, if you're a guy, like, you know what I'm talking about, right? Our, our identity, our ego is so tied into our vocation, what we do. 
So what do you have in your hand? He had his identity. He, he had his ability because that, that was a tool for his craft. That was a tool. I, he would use that to defend the sheep at times. He would use that, that staff to maybe protect. And he'd use that, that, that staff to help. He'd use that staff to guide them. He would use that staff in his work. It was his, it was his ability. It was, it was his confidence. Like with that staff, he felt, I, I can do this job. He'd been doing it for 40 years. God says, throw it on the ground. Let go. So he does. You read this story, it's like, as soon as the staff hits the ground, it turns into a snake. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm over here now. Yes. I don't know about you, I do not like snakes. If I see them first, I'm, I'm okay. Like, no joke, like, I, I like to mountain bike. So I'm up in the hills, and where we live, there's, like, like out here, there's rattlesnakes up in the hills, and so I come around this corner, and I see it. It's like a little baby one. And you have to be really be more scared of those, I've heard, you know, so I'm, a, I'm afraid of all of them, so it doesn't really matter. So I come around the corner, and I go around it, and I go on, and I jump off my bike, and my, my phone is clipped on my bike. I take my phone off, because I'm going to get a picture. And I go back there, and it's gone back in behind a rock, and I, now I can't remember which bush and which rock, because I, I actually went a little ways to make sure I was safe, you know. So I make my way back. That old man that came out of this rock, just this little one, and I squealed like a little girl. And I jumped on my bike, never got a picture, and poof, I'm gone. So I don't, I don't like bikes. Now, Dudley, you know, he's a road biker. He likes to be, you know, he's a king. He's the boss on that bike. He can go for miles and miles and miles and miles. I, I would much rather be on a cliff with a rattlesnake than riding on the road while all of you people are texting and driving. I don't want to do that. So I would rather be there, but I still hate snakes. Okay, back to our story. So Moses takes his staff, throws it on the ground, becomes a snake. Then God says, pick it up by the tail. No, that's not how you pick up a... Okay, you're God, I'm not. He picks it up and it turns right back into a staff. But notice, it wasn't until he let go that God did what only God can do. We got, we got to be willing to share. Like, hey, little boy, what do you, what do you got? Um, sack lunch. Don't you wonder if he asked the same question? Like, you're going to try to feed all these people with this? Are you serious? Maybe he asked the same. We don't, we don't have that conversation, but we know that he was willing to share. So he gives it to Jesus. Now, here's what I want you to do from it. I want, I want you to think about what's in your hand. Now, I've been thinking about this, and you're just hearing it, but I'm going to ask you, what's in your hand? And let, let me help you. Right? Everybody put your hands out. Come on, like this. Right out there in front of you. Yeah, even you in the back. I see you. Okay, there you go. All right, so here's what you have in your hand. Every one of us, we have time. Every one of us. We have abilities, skill sets. We have money. <laughs> some stacks are higher than other stacks, but we all have some. Let me, let me tell you, as a follower, keep your hands out there. As a follower of Christ, you also have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. You also have grace. And it's like, that is all what God has placed in your hand. And you know what he's gonna ask you to do? Share it. He's, he's placed those things in your hand, and he wants you to share it. Now, you can put your hands down. Most of you already did, but thank you uh, for, for doing that with me for a second, because I, I want you to understand this. <laughs> When God said to Moses, you know, throw down that staff, then God did what only he could do. Moses began to make a connection here. It really isn't about me. It's about him. But I, I, I got to be willing to be a part of it, right? Yeah. Over, over three years ago, we lost my sister-in-law, my wife's sister. She passed away of a disease called non-alcoholic sclerosis of the liver. She was on the liver transplant list. She finally got that liver. There were some complications that evening. I'm giving you the short version, but... Um, her heart had some trouble. The new liver was damaged. Three weeks later, we gathered her around her and said goodbye. We'll see you later. But, but in that year, leading up to that, that moment, I watched my wife take care of her sister. Now, her sister lived in Anaheim Hills. We live out in Hemet. It's like an hour and 10 to hour and 30 minute. Could be three hour drive. You know how it is in Southern California, right? But it's, let's just call it an hour and 20 minute drive. And so for probably six to nine months, she would go out there for four to five days a week and just stay there and take care of her sister. What did she have? She didn't have medical background, but she had time. And she had a care and a love and a concern for her sister. And she just took care of her. She 
got her up in the morning, got her her right pills, made sure she ate what she was supposed to eat, made sure she didn't eat what she wasn't supposed to eat, it would make things worse for her body. She just took care of, got her to her doctor appointments. She had, she had time and she gave it to her sister. I will tell you, even, even to this day as I, as I think about it, I'm like, I'm more in love with my wife because I saw that. I saw what she was willing to do. It wasn't always easy. But, but it gave me a perspective I really hadn't had up until that point in my life. And so now when somebody comes up to me and they say, Pastor John, I really wish I could help more. I wish I could do ministry, but, but I'm, I'm at home taking care of my mom. I'm like, that, that is ministry. That is ministry. You are the hands and feet of Jesus, even if it is in your own home or even if it is for a relative. Like you are caring for them, loving them. You're doing the work of God in that place and you are sharing what's in your hand, your time, your ability, your love for them. Don't ever underestimate how important that ministry really is. And so thank you for those of you who are doing that right now. I mean, it's huge. And you're willing to do that with, with what's in your hand. Well, this little boy, he was open to the idea and he was willing to share. By, by the way, when it comes to sharing, we typically think when we give something away, it, it like, that's it, it's gone. That's not how it works with, with God. Did you know that? Like, how many, how many basketfuls were left over? Twelve. So he gave his lunch but he got to eat even more than he brought, right? That, that one little boy. And then everybody else got to eat a whole bunch. And there were still leftovers. Like, even though we give it away, it doesn't mean it's gone. It means God uses it. But, but he somehow, like, amazingly, like, replenishes what we give away so that, so that we're, we're met. Our needs are met in the process. That, that's how God operates. But, but here's what I want you to get for number three. Write this down. He trusted Jesus with the results. He trusted Jesus with the results. Again, here's the question. What's this one little sack lunch? What's these five little barley loaves and these two fish? What's that gonna do for 15,000 people? How, seriously. But he's, he's open to the idea, he's willing to share, and he just says, okay, Jesus, I'll just, I'll leave that up to you. I don't know how it's gonna work, but there you go, right? I was in Bible college. I was at Ozark Christian College in, in Missouri. And my freshman year, I was with two of my buddies. We went to a, a church in town on a Sunday. And uh, I, I had grown up, my parents taught me about tithing, and I'd already tithed that month and stuff. But that particular day, I had a $5 bill in my pocket. Now, at our school, um, they would close the cafeteria on Sundays, like breakfast, dinner, nothing. There was nothing available to eat on Sundays. So if you didn't have any cash on you, you like, you start, I mean, fasted. <laughs> it was a Christian school, so we would fast if we didn't have any money. So... I had five bucks. No, with five bucks back in those days, I could get two Whoppers, fries, and a drink for under $5. And so that was my plan. We're going to go to church, and I got my $5. My buddies and I, we're all going to go to Burger King. We're going to get two Whoppers, fries, and a drink. That, that was the plan, right? So we show up at church. First problem is we walk into church, and the pastor who we wanted to hear wasn't there. Can you believe how rude that is? Like, I totally know how you felt today, right? Now we got this short, bald guy we're listening to. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Pillars is closed, otherwise I'd be over there right now. So we would get there, and the pastor we wanted to hear is not even speaking, and on top of that, it was a missionary. Now, I love missionaries, but I was thinking, they don't know how to communicate with us in America. This guy's been gone for like decades in Africa or something. He doesn't know how to talk to us. It's not going to be interesting. Most missionaries, they bring out their little pictures, and the last one is like this field. The, the harvest is what, you know, I, I know how missionaries operate. It's like, that, that's what they're going to do. I've been there, done that, seen that. It's not going to be that interesting. Man, I just was blown away that day. And God got a hold of me. And I'm sitting there at the end of the service. They're like, hey, I know we already took up the offering, but we're going to pass the plates again. And everything that goes in the plates this time goes to help this missionary and what they're doing. Well, not my $5. I mean, it's like I got two offers, fries, and a drink. I know. I know what I'm doing with my $5. Now, I never heard an audible voice from God once, but he and I had an argument the whole time. 
Like I'd see the trays go back. I, no, I thought, I'm going to eat. That's why. And I literally remember saying this. What's $5 going to do for all the needs they just talked about? $5 isn't going to help them, but it's sure going to help me. Two whoppers, fries, and a drink. Oh, and the tray keeps getting closer. I, was, ah, I gave my money. And I was like, ah. It was a joyful experience. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. He didn't love me right then. I know that. I was just not happy about it. Because now I'm thinking, I've got to lie to my friends. You're like, what? Yeah, I didn't want them to know I didn't have any money. So now I'm thinking, I've got to tell them, instead of going to Burger King, why don't you just drop me off at school because i got, I got homework to do. <laughs> then they would know I'm lying, right? So it's like, I don't know what I'm going to say. We're on our way out to the car, and this, this couple stops us at the door, and I say, excuse me, are you three young men? Are you from Ozark? And we're like, yes. And then, are you studying to be preachers? And we're like, yes. And We'd like to take you out for a steak dinner today. Yes! Yes! That's how my God does it, right? Woo! Anybody ever hear of the Golden Corral? I think that's what it was called. Like, I, not only did I have steak, baked potatoes, an all-you-can-eat salad bar. It's like, oh, God is so good. And here's the best thing. He was able to take that $5 and do something that I never could have done with $5. And he multiplied that somehow and that, that mission work. It's like, that's what God does, right? It's like, we, we think that it's all done, but no, just leave all those details, leave all that stuff up to Jesus, trust him with the results. And there's one more thing. Write this down. He got to be a part of a miracle. Again, the story's about Jesus, but we're looking at it through the eyes of this little boy. He got to be a part of the miracle, in all four of these gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they tell this story, none of them give us much detail. We don't know his name. And we don't know what happened when he went home. I wish they would have included that. So I'm going to make it up. <laughs> Hopefully that's okay. If it's not, just stay tight, all right? Sit there. But I've been thinking a lot about this story for the last several years. And I, I love this story. And I'm just like, what, what was it like when he went home? Like, what happened, right? And then I have another kind of a, a side story to this whole thing, too. The Bible doesn't say this, but I think, I think they gave the little boy one of the baskets full of food. That makes sense, right? He brought a little sack lunch. Here, Jesus. And Jesus goes, here's, there you go. Thank you for helping with the miracle today. Here's a basket for you, right? Boom. So this little boy takes the basket all the way home, and he finally gets there, and he sets it outside the door. His mom's inside. He's like, well, how am I going to do this, you know? Okay. Hey, Mom, I'm home. Oh, honey, did you have a good time? Yeah, it was great. Did you get to see Jesus? Yeah, I saw Jesus. Man, I, was, I, was, I got to be up close to Jesus. It was, it was amazing. Did you get enough to eat? Well, I actually, I actually gave my lunch away to somebody else. Oh. <laughs> you know, you moms know what I'm telling. You're just like, oh. You know that feeling you get when your neighbor tells you your, your kid said please and thank you? They finally, it took them 600 years of training, and they finally did it on their own. <sighs> and he says, Mom, I gave my lunch away. And she's like, oh, and right away, she just rushes into the kitchen, and she starts, let me, let me get you something. He goes, no, no, I didn't say I didn't have anything to eat. He goes, in fact, I'm stuffed. I don't think I can eat another thing the rest of the day. She goes, what do you mean? You just said you gave away your lunch. He goes, yeah, I gave it to Jesus. She goes, what? And she stops and she turns around and he goes, in fact, mom, you don't have to make any food the rest of the week. Hold on. Check this out, mom. <laughs> I mean, I, the Bible doesn't say that happened. I think that's how it happened. <laughs> and you might think, you might think you're a long way from a miracle. <laughs> but every miracle begins with just a single step in the right direction. And it's a step that says, God, I'm, I'm open. I don't know how you're going to do this. Maybe where you work, you're surrounded by complete idiots. <laughs> you're, you're surrounded by people who they, they don't know God, don't care about God, and they're rude and abusive. And you're like, you're stuck in the middle. What am I doing here, God? I, wa I want to go work you know, somewhere where I'm a Christian. No, you might be exactly where God wants you. You are the light in that darkness. 
And a miracle could happen there if you'll just be open to the idea and be willing to share what's in your hand, right? Your, your time, your love, your patience. Share just that, that listening ear. I mean, how valuable is that to somebody, right? Some of you are about to go back to school. Some of you young people are getting ready to go back to school. Sorry to bring up the S word. But you're going to go back there, man. That's a mission field. And you might have your little group of friends that you hang out with because you man, the rest of them, man, it's, it's, it's a crazy place. I know it's a crazy place. We live right next to a high school. Our church is right across the street from the biggest high school in our valley. And I know what goes on there. But I'm going to tell you, you, you might be the one God uses this year to really break out and change and, and, and do something miraculous in that place. And you're like, yeah, but I can't. Yeah, but I don't. Yeah, but I... Don't worry about that stuff. Leave the results up to him and just go and be faithful. And be, loved. be the one that God can use that day. See, really, the story of the, the feeding of the 5,000, we call it, is really a story of Jesus. But how would the story would have been different with somebody else, right? Like, Jesus will use somebody, but this little boy says, hey, I'll do it. Don't you want to be that person? I love reading the stories of miracles. I love reading the stories of what God has done in somebody else's life. But there's times in my life where I close the book and I'm saying, cool for them. I want it to happen in my life. I want to be the one. I don't know how that's going to work. I'm just going to leave that to him, but I'm going to be faithful. And I'm going to take what I got in my hand and say, God, you can use this. Sometimes it's going to require a little money. Sometimes it's going to require a little time. Sometimes it's going to require some of my skill set, something I do. But I'm going to go and I'm going to be there for somebody. I'm going to help them. I want you to have that passion this year in 2022, that you would be the one that somebody else needs. God's going to use you to make a difference in their life. That's going, listen to this, that's going to last for eternity. And it may seem insignificant, like a little sack lunch. It may seem insignificant, just the amount of time maybe you spend with somebody. But the way you treated them changed the trajectory of their life for all of eternity, just because you showed them God's love and his grace. You can do that. By the way, I can't do that in some places because I have pastor in front of my name. And they're not gonna let me in, but they'll let you in. Don't think I'm more important than you. We're, not, we're all in this together. And you can go places I can't go. And I might be able to get to some places you don't, but it's like, let's all just do what God has called us to do in the places where, where we can influence people. And let's, let's be that one that makes a difference this year. So here's what I want you to know. And I'm going to wrap this up. And I, I literally mean I'm going to wrap it up. Sometimes when a pastor says that, they're still going for 20 minutes. I'm wrapping it up. But I want you to know this. Some of you, your first step in being the one is opening up your life and your heart to Jesus. And it could be that today, as we begin 2022, you might make the most significant decision of your life right now and just say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you. And right after I pray, I'm going to give you direction. If, if that's your decision or, or you want to pray with somebody, talk to somebody, you want to be baptized, whatever that is, I want to give you some direction right after I pray, but I, but I want you to pray with me right now. Okay, can we do that? Let's just all bow our heads. God, thank you for this special moment at the beginning of a brand new year. That God, we had that sense that there's a clean slate. And God, maybe we blew it yesterday. Maybe we blew it big time last year. But God, today, now, starting now, we're gonna just open up our hands, open up our life and say, God, please use me. For, for all of us, it's that simple. Use me. We're gonna get up every day. We're gonna pray that. Use me. But there are some here right now who are ready to say, God, take me. I wanna be yours. Be my king, be my Lord, be my boss. I can't do this on my own. And God, the, the moment the moment that they say that, the moment that they whisper that from their heart to yours, we know you're standing there, arms wide open, saying, welcome to the family. God, we thank you for that beautiful picture we get in our baptism where we, we died to our old self, we're raised to walk in a new life. We, we thank you for those who are gonna do that and start their journey with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. So here's some direction, okay? Here's some direction. If you want to talk to somebody, you have a question, you want prayer, you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, you want to be baptized, right through those double doors right over there, immediately when I dismiss you, just take off, just go. Don't let anything hold you back. Just tell your family, I'll be back, and just go, all right? That, that's your job next. 
What I want all of us to do is I want us to stand up. This is how I'm gonna close today. And thank you for letting me be a part of your new year. I want you to put your hands out again one more time. And let me pray a blessing over what's in your hands as we move into this new year. God, every person in this room, every person online, we just ask that you would fill them with the things that they need to make a difference today, tomorrow, this week. You know, we, we can think about the whole year, but we're just gonna think one day at a time. God, use us today. It may be in the restaurant we go to after church. It may be with a neighbor. It may be with a friend. It may be at work tomorrow, but we're like right away, God, just take the time and the ability and the love and the stuff that you put in our life in our hands, and God, use these things. In a way, we just wanna keep our hands open. When you need it, it's there. And when you wanna put more in, our hands are still there. So God, use us in 2022. Use Shepherd to make a massive difference in this area. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. Have a happy new year.